Hey guys, I'm here with Jeff Nippet, who's just finished his presentation on science communication, and it was really cool to get an insight into, you know, behind the scenes when it comes to actually trying to communicate science and producing content and things like that. So Jeff, I wanted to just start off by, you know, talking about how you actually got into the industry and, you know, were you always evidence-based or was there something that instigated you into the transition into, you know, evidence-based fitness? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I, I started definitely as a bodybuilder first, okay. but I had this like, independent interest in science like I did right. like science in high school okay. but I just wasn't aware of the fact that there was a science of bodybuilding yeah, right it's not it, many people yeah. associate science with fitness yeah so, yeah. yeah exactly okay. um, so it took me a while to actually get put onto some of that stuff it was actually well into university uh, before I did so around like 2012 I started following guys like Lane Norton and right. some of the other science communicators who really just like got me so hooked on all this totally. stuff. Like I just got totally obsessed with it, reading all kinds of different stuff. And that was probably like that learning phase, the initial learning phase where you feel like you're figuring everything yeah. out right for the first it's time. Exciting, isn't it? That's the most yeah. exciting part, man. Like yeah, I need that totally again now. Yeah, 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 new, totally right? like, yeah. Um, when yeah. new information comes out, like, I get that same, mm -hmm. that same feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of came in a different order. I was definitely went through like my bro phase yeah. where it was just like whatever the biggest guy at the gym said, that's what yeah. I did, right? Yeah. Um, but then once I was introduced to the science aspect, then that was what really got me okay. super passionate about yeah. it. Yeah. Cool. And why is science important? Like, why does it matter? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I think that's a good question, and like you definitely have people who fall on the side of let's say like science skepticism, right? Especially okay. insofar as it applies to to bodybuilding. You have people who are like, eh, the bros did it better, they get better results, whatever. You have people who take a minimal approach, so they're like, okay, well, progressive overload matters, but all the other stuff doesn't really matter that much. I think you don't actually need science to get good results, right? If you have good genetics and you do a good training program, you can get good results. I think that science is good because it gives you, for one, a solid knowledge foundation okay. within which you can layer on top right. other stuff from people in the field who have been successful. Yeah. Um, also, I think that being good at the science of fitness can make you a better learner in yeah. general. It can make you understand well. other stuff. Yeah. yeah, so it can just improve, I would say, your scientific literacy just in general, yeah. right? So you can just make you more aware of things and live a more fulfilled yeah. life as a result. That. So it extends beyond just what happens in the gym. Okay. But of course, if you want to optimize things in the gym and get the best results you can, I do think that an integrated, evidence-based approach where you're borrowing from science and from successful yeah. examples, that's how you're going to get the best yeah. means. And I noticed in your um, presentation, we're talking about how you got some information from John Meadows, mm -hmm. some information from Alberto Nunez, and mm -hmm. you've kind of combined that, mm -hmm. and you now even have like your own strategy. So mm -hmm. can you just give us a bit brief rundown of like what you've learned from Meadows and Nunez and even other, other you know, bodybuilders out there that you've trained with? Yeah, I, I've definitely collaborated with a lot of people. This is actually a new thing that I'm wanting to do more of on my right. channel. So I want to yeah. introduce people to training styles that might fall maybe slightly outside of the evidence-based purview, line. right? But there's something that you can definitely borrow from them and integrate into your approach. So I use the quote, keep an open mind, but not so open your brains fall out. So basically your brains are like that foundation of science-based okay. knowledge, right? And then you're open to the other stuff. Right. right. Um, so yeah, w with John, the thing that I think I got the most from John is that he does train really hard. Like he's got a really solid work yeah. ethic, and I feel like that's something that's just valuable yes. in general. Like whether you take a science-based approach or not, working hard matters. Right? I think that's something that's ingrained in him. Mm -hmm, exactly. And seeing it in the gym, it's almost like he has this like, I don't know if I would call it rage, but like he controls it until it's like the right time to bring yeah. it out, and then it's just like, yeah. Boom, like yeah. beast mode, so right? So it gives absolute 100% to each set. Yeah, I wouldn't, I would say 100% in terms of like focus, but in okay. terms of like actually having nothing left, right. he actually is pretty methodical with that. Like okay. he, he'll reserve it for when it's the right yeah. time in the workout. Yeah. Um, so that, that was something I definitely learned yeah. from him. Yeah, and you talked about the four strategies that he uses. Mm -hmm. so he used like an activator, mm -hmm. and then uh, a compound movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you were listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. It was a compound <laughs> movement. Then it was. Um, then it's a pump. A pump and yeah. a and length, a length, length, and stretch. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so that's that an interesting that way to incorporate it. Into yeah, your training? I have especially the lengthening stuff at the end. Okay. I really like that as a finisher. So like, yes. if I have say a back focused day or a pull day or whatever, like finishing with some kind of pullover yeah. or like stretch focused okay. movement. I do do the activator stuff, but maybe not always in the same way he does it. Like right. I do 
activation probably at a lower intensity than he would. He probably pushes it a little harder, yeah. but I still do that. Like if I might have a back day before I hop into pull-ups, I'll usually do some kind of pull-in or something like that to get things firing, then jump into the heavy stuff. Yeah, sure. It just feels better. Man. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And sometimes yeah. you do have to go by the feel, don't you? Mm -hmm. Even if science does not you know, say that this is the way you should do it, if it feels good, then... Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, like I said, it's always that blend, and the science does show that feel does matter to an extent, right? There is support for the mind-muscle connection, so um, I think that that's one example where the bros got it right, we thought they got yeah. it wrong, yeah. and then we said, oh wait, no, never mind. Yeah, mind-muscle kind of right. connection is actually pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you also talked about training hard, and I think this is something that can really bottleneck a lot of um, you know gym trainees' um, progress in the gym. Like, you know, they start getting into the science, seen and they see that you know you should keep a few reps left in the tank but then they end up just not training hard enough mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. over time that probably does uh, reduce the amount of progress that they can make in the gym so what's it go with training hard like you know can you give us a brief outline of what you spoke about today mm -hmm. so i think this really depends on the audience because some people like you said will hear about the evidence-based yep. thing and then they use that almost like as an excuse to see how much they right. little they can do, yeah, okay. right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. How, what's the least amount I can do and still progress? Yeah, that doesn't really mesh with my mentality. Yeah. I would rather look at it like, if I can get a little more results by working a little harder, or by doing a little more, yeah. then that's gonna be worth it for me, mm -hmm. even if it's a little bit more inherently risky. Like, yeah. that is kind of my approach towards like, more of what I would think would be like a champion's right. mindset, yeah, okay. right? Um, so, when it comes to working hard, if you have someone who has taken on that like, almost like really conservative mm -hmm. approach where they're leaving way more in the tank than yeah. they should be. Like you see them in the gym, right? And they got all yeah. the abstracts, yeah. they know all the science, yeah. but it's like, dude, like, you could just train put so some much weight on, yeah, you know like, what I mean, right? You have to respect like progressive resistance, you know? Yeah, exactly. So for the, if I'm speaking to them, I'm saying, yeah, dude, like see where your limits are, like actually push yourself harder. Those are usually my experience people who haven't like don't have an athletic background. Okay. Like yeah. if you have an athletic background, you're probably used to exerting yeah, right. yourself harder. You're probably, to, yeah, you're probably more in tune to like how hard you can actually push yourself. Exactly, well. yeah. So yeah. for them, I say that. But then on the other side, you have these like hardcore head case bodybuilders yeah. that are like, if it's not to failure, it doesn't yeah. count. Right. And in their case, I would say, you know, well, train hard is probably not the best thing they need yeah. to hear, yeah. right? They need to hear about the recovery stuff yeah. that a lot of the other yeah. guests talked about, right? So it's always a balance and it always depends on context, but yeah. in my own personal training, I think that you know, training hard and doing that has a place, but it has to fit within mm -hmm. context yeah, of all yeah. the other stuff. And obviously you have to take into account how many days individuals train as well. So yeah, if you're training six days a week, balls to the wall, you probably do have to pay a bit more attention to fatigue management and recovery. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sweet. And neck training. That yeah. is probably the most important thing out of your whole yeah, presentation. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. talk to us about neck training. How can we optimize it? Why is it important? Yeah, for sure. So this is something like I haven't seen at all in the evidence-based community, so I wanted to introduce it into the talk. There's a bit of research on it, but it kind of borrows mostly from like the combat community. Boxers okay. have done it forever. Like if you look on YouTube, Joe Rogan is training his neck, uh, Mike Tyson is training his neck, like all kinds of football players. So it is popular in athletics in general, it just hasn't made its way to bodybuilding for some reason. I think of the neck similar to how I would like the calves or the forearms. Right. They're not going to win a show with having the, like, the best neck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to win a show yeah. on your forearms, yeah. but it might help differentiate okay. physiques yeah, yeah. and it helps tie the physique together. Yeah. Right? So like if you have someone who doesn't have good calves, it's like eh, whatever. Like they've got a good, everything else flows really nicely. Yeah. You're not going to lose necessarily, but if it's super close between you and another guy and you've got better calves, I think yeah, you might win. Yeah. I actually think the neck registers this way, like even subconsciously amongst judges. Like if you're hitting a front relaxed pose and there's no, it looks like you have like a bobblehead yeah, right. on your head. I think that that can take away from the yeah. overall aesthetic appearance of the physique. And like you said, probably the traps as well. I think so too. I think it all ties together in the back of the neck yeah. is the traps, okay. right? The traps yeah, go all it. the way up to yeah. the skull. So you, the best way to train that part of the neck is through head extension, not through shrugs. Okay. The research shows that shrugs don't really that, that well, at least what, based on what we have, right? Um, so, yeah, I would say it's one of those muscles, one of those accessory muscles that really tends to ne get neglected. It's getting more popular now, so I think it's cool to introduce it and see sure. what you know some people who might be doing more active yeah. research would think about. Yeah, it. and then not have even may, may even have implications for like rehab and you know, people who do get neck pain, like yeah. you said, like you haven't yeah. had any neck pain yeah. since you've been yeah, training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really listen. Yeah, yeah. 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 I tried to. Good job. Good job. Um, <laughs> all right, and you use the uh, neck. What is it? The so the, uh, I use a neck flex. Right. That's like yeah. pro level equipment. Okay. Um, so it's 
very high quality. Um, you can get cheaper versions, but I love that because it's it's a very versatile piece of equipment. And basically, you know, if you're new to it, I would say get some kind of head harness where you can hook yeah. weight onto it, and so you can train extension. Yeah. Just because if you don't have that headgear, then just trying to like load a plate on the back of your head is like uncomfortable. You you lose your I've done it a lot. You lose your balance on the bench, and then once you get to a certain point of strength, um, it's just not enough. Not enough loading potential. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, what's what's coming up for Jeff Nippet in the you know the next um, coming months in the next year or so? Yeah, good question, man. Like I've got so much travel planned okay. right now. After this, we're going to Bali oh, for yeah. a vacation, so that's what I need That'd first. Be fun. <laughs> and then yeah. After that, how long are you staying there? Uh, a week. Okay. So that's, that's a good amount of time. Yeah. Any more than that, and I'm like, I it's more than enough. Like it's just relaxing. Yeah, throughout. exactly. Whole week that's, is fine. That's enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I want to do some like reading there, like just okay. even outside fitness and stuff. Yeah. Just like uh, yeah, just relaxation. And after that, um, I definitely want to continue to do things with YouTube. I have several new series planned. My main thing right now is I want to do, I want to travel and yeah. collaborate with people who I think have a cool approach or an interesting approach that we can borrow things from, showcase that on my channel, and then kind of show how. Am I going to implement all of this, a little bit of this? And like, I think that it'll open up people yeah. to different yeah, right. sorts of approaches. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah. just trying to get bits and pieces from here. Right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. new series. It's going to be sick, man. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So stay tuned. You can find Jeff, obviously, on his YouTube channel, and he's got Instagram and whatnot. So thank you very much. Yeah, right. It's a pleasure. Perfect. No thank worries. You.